Amen, church. Welcome to the Sunday night service. If we can all gather around the front here. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If you're here tonight and you're dealing with any infirmities, or if you're not, if you're dealing with joy, the Lord deserves the same type of worship. Will you guys please join me in worshiping the Lord, the kings of kings, the Lord of lords, before we start this service. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the infirmities, God, that make us perfect in you. We ask tonight that, you're, that you take our infirmities and that you strengthen us through them, God. That you give us the power, God, to do your will tonight. To be sensitive to your will for, for tonight's service, God. Put your hand on your mind. Lord, I ask tonight that you, clear, that you make a, give us a pure mind, Lord. Clear our minds out, God, so that we can serve you, Lord, and what you deserve. For the last 10 seconds, can we just give the Lord some praise? Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Help the praise team as we come before the Lord with singing. Amen. We're ready for a downpour. Let it fall fresh. Let it fall fresh on us. We're ready for revival. Let it fall fresh. Let it fall fresh on us. It's coming down. It's pouring out. The time is now. We need the rain. Everybody's we need the rain. The we need the rain. We need the rain. Oh, oh. 
Here's my worship, all of my worship. Receive my worship, all of my worship. Sing you, Lord, you, Lord.
Clap our hands to the Lord right now. He's worthy. Thanks to the Lord. God, we love you. How great you are. We worship and adore you, Lord. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of God here tonight. Amen. Thank God. Y'all just feel Joshua, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank the Lord. We serve a great God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Turn around and look at somebody next to you and tell them whatever you need, God's got it here tonight. Amen. There's a sweet touch of the Holy Ghost in this house. Hallelujah. God bless you as you make your way back to your seat. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before we move on to the service, I just want to take a moment, introduce myself and to our guests that are here with us tonight. We're going to greet you here in just a, a bit, but... I want to say it's good to have you here. Uh, if I haven't yet met you, my name is Rob McKee, and I'm the senior pastor here at the Pentecostals. We're thrilled that each of you are with us tonight in the house of God. And it has been quite the week for us personally as a family, and uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who <clears throat> um, served and helped uh, to... Uh, in the, in the ceremony of our daughter, Savannah, and, and uh, Brother George and Pedigo. <coughs> it, was a, uh, it was a great event. We were able to see family members and ministers from 
across uh, the country, and it was so good to have each of them here with us. We have several guests that are still here uh, in town today. Good to see our good friend, Brother Michael Kennedy, and a long, long time friend of ours, and all the other folks, uh, Brother D Daniel, where are you, Brother Daniel? All right, God bless you, Brother Daniel. Edens, our former youth pastor, served as youth pastor here for some time. Glad to see him here with us this weekend. And uh, just it just feels good to be in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Anybody love the Lord tonight? I love what I feel in this place. And I believe that God is doing great things. We've had so many victories and wins over the past few days but I just feel like at this point God wants to step in and minister to somebody's need I don't know who I'm speaking to here tonight but I, I just I, I sincerely feel in the Holy Ghost that someone has come looking for answers for their life you feel like your life has fallen apart and you need some kind of direction and you even spoke to yourself this week I need a reorder of my life. I need God to bring some order. You've come to the right place, and God is here to do just that today. Amen. He's going to bring some order. Amen. Amen. At this time, ask him, Brother Chris present to come and uh, lead us in our giving. Hallelujah. What a way to start the service with Josh receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can we clap our hands to the Lord one more time? Hallelujah. He's worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Why don't you turn around to your, to your neighbor and tell them the chain breakers in the house here tonight. The chain breakers in the house and anything can happen in this service here tonight. We want to give you another opportunity to worship the Lord by our tithing and our giving at this time. If you're giving by cash or check, would you raise your hands? Our usher would be bringing an envelope to you. There are several ways here to give at the POK, as you can see behind me on my screen. But if you're giving by cash or check, would you raise your hands? Our usher We'll bring an envelope to you. At this time, we'll have some uh, video announcements. If you can uh, focus on our screen. Welcome to the Pentecostals of Katy. We are so glad you joined us this Sunday. Please pay close attention to the screen as we discuss some upcoming events happening here at the POK. Hey POK, our annual men's barbecue cook-off competition is right around the corner on August the 19th. The meat choice this year is pork ribs. Competition starts at 7 a.m. and the judging begins at noon. It's a $50 entry per team, max of four teammates. All teams must prepare and cook their ribs on site. Any team that prepares off site will be disqualified. It's a $15 entry for those that won't be competing. Plates will be served starting at noon. Bring the family and come support POK Men's Ministry. You can get some information and sign up at the Connections booth in the foyer. Tickets are now available for a Faith and Family Night on August 26th. It will begin at 6.35 p.m. at the Constellation Field in Sugarland after the baseball game. Tickets are $15 per person and can be purchased in the foyer after service today. Every first Sunday of the month, starting today, the POK will have items such as t-shirts, hoodies, and much more on sale in the foyer. Stop by today after the service to claim some POK merch. On Wednesday, August 9th, we will have our membership experience class. New members will have the opportunity to connect with the pastoral staff and learn more about the history and the future of our church. If you want more information, please visit the Connect booth in the foyer. If you are a guest, we invite you to join us in the foyer at our Connect booth. Thank you for your attention during these announcements. And once again, we are so excited to have you join us this Sunday here at the POK. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, yes. We do have one more verbal announcement at this time. Uh, there will be an opportunity in October for you to be part of history, making and helping to build a church in a day. Hallelujah. All skills are needed, whether you have construction skills or just wanted to help, you are needed to build this church in one day. A fun fact is the Pentecostals of Katy was actually built in a church in a day project. Hallelujah. So if you want to sign up or if you want to talk, if you want more information about being part of building a church in a day you can see brother robley taylor or you can visit texaschurchinaday.com you can go in there find out more information i believe the location will be in uh, kyle texas it is my understanding it will be in kyle texas so it's not far from here so if you want to be part of that please connect with rob taylor at this time or you can go to the website texaschurchinaday.com at this time can we stand please let's go to the lord in prayer at this time 
Let's thank God for all, all that he's done for us this week. Let's thank him for every blessing that's been poured in our family, for every blessing that's been poured on us in this church and every single one of us at this time. Would you raise your tithing and offering this time? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to give back to your kingdom, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our jobs. We thank you, Lord, for our health. We thank you, Lord, for our family. We thank you, Lord, for our church, for every single one of us. We thank you, Jesus, for giving us an opportunity to give back to your kingdom. Use it for the advance of kingdom in Jesus name we pray amen you can bring your tithing and offering to the front
up out of your mouth uh, when you couldn't see your way out. Uh. Oh, I want to testify to somebody. You can get up out of your grave. Can get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. You say, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of Come that on, grave. tap your neighbor, tell him, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. You can up, leave this up, place set free tonight. You can grave. leave this place get different up, tonight. Get up, get up. Consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou hast visited him? But 
Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion all over all the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl, the air, and the fish of the sea. O oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. I'm telling you, I'm thankful for the name of Jesus. It is an excellent name, a saving name, a delivering name. Hallelujah. Somebody just shout his name. Isaiah 12, he said, cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion. Here's why, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. When you figure it out, you're going to make some noise. When you realize the Lord is in this place. If you didn't know it, I'm just here to declare, Jesus is here tonight. He's in this house. Amen. I love what I feel here. Amen. Amen. I feel victory. I feel joy. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Turn around to three people and tell them, God's not finished. Amen. He's not done. He's not finished. God's got something more. Amen. It is so good to be here. You may be seated. Thank God for what we felt thus far in the service. And um, I want to take just a moment. I know we've got a lot planned tonight, but I want to take just a moment and, um, 
and have a visiting pastor come and greet us. And uh, it is so good to have uh, Pastor Ken Bowling, uh, Bollinger. And I say that was, it's okay, Ken Bollinger. And uh, in case you're wondering why Brother Kate looks so nice tonight and he's sitting up straight and tall, it's because uh, this is his father-in-law and he's got to behave tonight. And so, uh, but it is so good to have he and his wife here. Of course, we have quickly fallen in love with Sister Larissa. She is an amazing blessing to our congregation. What a wonderful, what a wonderful lady. It's certainly... Their, their marriage certainly brought the IQ up in that family a little bit, and, uh, but I am, uh, we're so honored. I'm teasing. I give him a hard time, uh, but it is so good to have Brother Bowling here. Pastors in Lansing, Michigan, I believe, and uh, we're honored to have him here. Please, Brother Bollinger, please come and greet the congregation. Honored to have you here today. <laughs> I must have hit the off button. <laughs> Don't work as good that way. <laughs> Amen. As we were involved in the worship tonight and I watched people worshiping around, I understand that there is a power in our worship. And one of the main reasons that we worship is to worship God. The whole purpose of our magnifying is to magnify God. But there is a benefit from time to time that we receive because we worship God. I remember one time whenever we were evangelizing a thousand years ago, we were in a service on a Sunday night, and the pastor asked me, could, would I be able to preach still that night because I had lost my voice. I was down to a whisper, and I said, if they'll turn the monitor up and no one says amen, I should be able to do it. And uh, he said, okay. In the middle of the song service, I just have this habit, I gotta go ahead and sing whether I've got a voice or not. And in the middle of the singing, I went from nothing to everything in just one moment. It was a benefit of what God had done. Another time as we were in the middle of a message, I had walked, I had had pain in my ankle for over, over two weeks. I had to hobble to the platform. I was in so much pain. But in the middle of that service, in the middle of that preaching, the Lord impressed me to get down on the, on the altar area and begin to dance. I'm not a dancer, but as I began to walk across the front of that and then begin to jump, the Lord healed me of that affliction. It was a benefit. I was not doing it for me, I was doing it for him, but God has a way of bringing things out. I'm here to tell you that there may be someone here that has a need. If you'll respond in worship, God will meet your need. Lord bless you. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a big round of applause. Anybody happy to be in church? Anybody? like having fun in church i think if you're not having fun in church you're doing it wrong because when we get to heaven we're going to have a bunch of fun we're going to rejoice we're going to be glad there's going to be tons of shouting there's going to be tons of jumping and dancing i know i will be anybody going to join me once we get to that golden city hallelujah amen what an awesome pleasure it is to be in God's house. We want to welcome everybody to the Pentecostals. If this is your first or second time with us and you did not fill out a guest card, we want to make sure that you do because after service there are some gifts that you can redeem, but you have to fill out a guest card. If you checked in with the hostesses, that's good too. But if you did not do either, please raise your hand. Our ushers are going to walk through the congregation. If this is your first or second time with us and you didn't check in with the hostesses or fill out a guest card, we want to make sure that you do because we want to honor you this evening. We have several names with us. And before we honor the, our uh, guests, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving a big round of applause to all those that are tuning in online via Revival Radio, Facebook. Amen. Now, when I mention your name, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, we want to know where you're seated, because in a few moments, we're going to get up to greet each other. And we want to make sure that we greet all our guests. We have with us for the first time, Benjamin Mariela Manuel Aaron, Solomon, and Benjamin. Where are you guys seated? 
this. We're so glad that you guys are here. Welcome, welcome. We also have with us for the first time Esther, Stephen, and Matthias Barron. Where are you guys seated? Right here. We're so glad that you guys are with us. Welcome to the Pentecostals. We also have with us Aaron Villa. Aaron Villa, where are you seated? He's, he stepped out for a second. We want to welcome him either way. We also have with us Tristan McLean. Tristan, where are you seated today? We're so glad that you're here. <laughs> this is a guest of the Balboa family. We're so glad that you're with us. We also have Jaime Omero Guerrero with us. Where are you at, Jaime? Jaime, we're so glad that you're with us this evening. And we have several special guests with us that came in to be with us this weekend. We have the Bollingers. We want to welcome them. Thank you for being with us. We also have this next person I want to honor. I love so much, but when I first met them, I didn't like them at first. And sometimes that happens, you know. You just got to pray for me. But um, he was just too cool. I thought he, he had a cane. He looked like a million bucks. And uh, I thought he was like, who's this guy? I think he is Bruce Wayne. But uh, Daniel Eddins, a special guest. We're so glad. you. I love him. He's my brother in Christ. And I just want to welcome him to Katie. This is home. Although he's from Mississippi, we, we say he's ours. Um, we also want to welcome back home Ariel Lehman and the family. We're so glad you're back home with us this evening. We also adopted somebody. He's ours as well. I liked him immediately. Michael Kennedy, we're so glad you're back with us and Katie for this weekend. And we also want to welcome evangelist Matthew Taylor. We're so happy to see you. Where are you at? We're so glad that you're here. This is what we're going to do, church. <laughs> there, I see you. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is what we're going to do. I think we have one more. We want to make sure that we also greet Timothy, Timothy and Ashley for the first time. We're so glad that you guys are here. Welcome, welcome. This is what we're going to do, church. We're going to put five minutes on the screen. This is going to give you enough time to walk around, shake somebody's hand, let them know that you're having fun in church. Stand to your feet with me. Once that time runs out, if you wouldn't mind making your way back to your seat, and we'll move on with the service.
Take a moment. You may be seated just for a moment. I want to 
I want to say again, it is so good to have all of our guests here with us. And uh, if you were out a, m a moment ago, my name is Rob McKee and the beautiful lady standing over to my left, I started to say behind me, over here is my wife, Shara. And uh, amen, it's wisdom to check before you say they're standing behind you. Uh, so, but I'm so, amen. Uh, and, but it is good to have you here with us tonight, and I'm thankful for the goodness of the Lord. Amen. In just uh, a little while, we're not going to do it right now, but we're going to be praying for all of our students that are returning to uh, college. We're going to be asking God to keep them and keep their testimony. And <clears throat> now I realize we do have some that are attending Christian colleges, but we also have some that are leaving to attend uh, secular universities and I, I want to remind you that if you are into the sciences and you're having to take classes uh, do not let anyone don't let anyone tell you that science has disproved the uh, the uh, inerrancy of scripture amen the word of God can be trusted Amen. Science confirms the Genesis account. Amen. It seems like everything in our public school system today, and I thank God for some godly teachers that are pushing back against this, but there's so many forces in public education today that have ridiculed uh, scriptural conviction and say that if you believe in the Bible, you're foolish. But the truth is the fool has said in his, in his heart that there is no God. And uh, the, the source and I guess the substratum of all wisdom is to believe in God and believe in his word. And you can absolutely trust it. So as you go back to university, don't let anyone shake your faith. Stand for what's true. Amen. And uh, if you ever get hit with a professor trying to challenge your faith and you don't know what to say, call me. We'll figure something out together. And... Uh, uh, I may tag team with you and go to your class for you, but I, uh, I, I am so thankful that God has challenged our young people um, to pursue education. It's not everything, but it is important, and uh, I'm just so proud of so many of them. I want to take a moment. One of the values of our church, if you're new to our congregation, one of our values is that everyone finds a place to serve, and, uh, you know, uh, serving in ministry is a spiritual discipline. Just as prayer, um, fasting, reading the word, it is important that you serve in some capacity of ministry. Jesus said, if you're gonna be my disciple, then you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to pick up a towel and wash somebody's feet. You need to be willing to serve the, um, others within the body. And so it's important that everyone has some sort of an outlet of ministry of serving. You will never be a true disciple of Jesus Christ until you put a towel on your arm. Amen. So it's, it's so important. It's a value of ours. I want to take just a moment, and we're going to celebrate some folks that have found their towel of ministry. We try to do this regularly on Sunday night, and um, it's, it's a good reminder that, uh, that we need to serve, but also I think it celebrates the right thing. Amen. Whatever, um, Sam Walton said, whatever you hang from the ceiling, you're going to sell. But when it comes to church, we're not selling anything. But w we like to say, whatever you celebrate, you will duplicate. And we want everybody to know that we really believe it's important, it's critical that you find a ministry. And so we're going to celebrate some folks finding their towel of ministry. And the first individual that we want to celebrate um, uh, is... Uh, has been attending POK for less than a year. Uh, uh, just so, so friendly. And uh, she is, uh, she always has a smile on her face, a positive outlook. What a great character and, and a light to others. And has gotten involved in uh, not only the choir, but also our POK Cafe, which is an a evangelistic arm of our church. We use that to try to reach new guests. And so tonight, we want to celebrate Ariane Burton. Amen. Congratulations. 
Congratulations. Thank you for finding your town. All right. Uh, the next young lady that we want to uh, celebrate has um, been coming to POK for a very short time. And uh, she comes from a kingdom-driven family. She is very smart, very intelligent. She's funny. She's passionate. And um, she is involved in several ministries. Uh, I guess her chief ministry is outshining her husband. Uh, she's involved in... Uh, for preachers only, teaching, hostessing, and choir. Tonight, we want to celebrate Sister Larissa Wilson. Thank you for finding your time. Amen. Now put your hands together and let's welcome the POK choir as they return to sing.
there's not a devil in hell that can stop it. When God opens a door, no one can shut it. No one can shut it. No devil from hell can stop what
begin to minister to somebody next to you right now. Come on, let the Lord use you right now. Begin praying for your neighbor. Find somebody to pray with right now. God is moving in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. When God closes a door, he opens another. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, for what you're doing here right now. Hallelujah. Come on. Go ahead and get your breakthrough right now. Right now in this atmosphere. Let the Lord minister to your need. Father, we can't make it. Hallelujah. God, we worship you. Ministers, help us pray. Father, we love you. Minister to my brother right now, my sister right now. Whatever the need may be for the direction that they need. Renewing a purpose. Faith that you're going to work it out for your good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
There is an angelic host in this place tonight ministering to hearts. Come on, somebody needs their breakthrough right now. If God impresses you, step across the aisle if need be. Find somebody to pray with right now. Thank you, Lord. God, minister hope. God's going to turn it around. God's glory will be revealed. God's glory is going to be revealed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, that's it. Let the Lord minister right now. Hallelujah. Father, we can't make it without you. We need you, Lord. We need you in this place. What God is doing. Oh. Hallelujah. Touch of the Lord here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, this is this is the will of God right now. Let's not rush past what God is doing. Let the Lord minister. If you're a guest and you don't understand what's happening, this is the Spirit of God ministering to hearts. If you lift your hands as a sign of repentance and surrender, God will minister to you right now. Hallelujah. God, I can't make it without you. Lord, we need you. We need you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, 
is peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father. Coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever, I pray in fathomless billows. know it, sing it together. Well, it's peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Nothing like the peace of God in our life. Amen. Aren't you thankful? You can have peace in circumstances that are filled with stress and anxiety. You can be right in the middle of it all and have complete peace in your heart knowing that God's going to work it all out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God for what he's doing here tonight. I would like to do something in this atmosphere. I'd like to ask all of our college students that are leaving to go back to school. I know we've got some that are leaving this week. And um, we're going to pray for all of our school kids later. But <clears throat> our colleges start a little earlier. And so we're going to pray that God would, would direct them and keep them safe. And uh, I know we've got a group that's leaving from Urshan, or leaving for Urshan this week. So all of our Urshan students, come on over here, Sister Jackie, McKenna, Kaylee. Uh, yeah, so we're missing, who are we missing? All right, and we're missing McKenna. Where's McKenna? Uh, she may still be changing clothes. If somebody sees her back there, they could get her. Amen. Oh, there's some still praying back in the back. That, that would explain it. Amen. Thank God for what he's doing in this place today. If y'all could come and stand here in the center. Do we have any other college students that you're leaving to go away to school? You're in particular leaving your... All right. Amen. Thank God for all of these students. Amen. Let's give all of them a good hand. I'm proud of them. Their accomplishment. If you're trying to get through, ushers, ushers, if there's some people trying to come through. All right, right behind you. There you go. So any of our other college students, come on up, come on up. Amen. Anybody behind? Amen. Just we're going to wait for everybody. Wait for everybody to come up. Amen. I believe. How are we doing? I want to take, take the time. All right. Amen. I thank God all of our young people and what they're accomplishing in school. I believe in education and I am, um, I'm convinced that it does help. It doesn't, it doesn't define success. We have people that are very successful in their careers without an education. However, it's, uh, 
it's, it's important to get an education, and uh, it's much easier sometimes to get there if, uh, if you uh, get an education. So I just, I want all, each of you to know how much I appreciate you and uh, your commitment to learning. But remember, when you're sitting un under some of these, uh, these professors, if you're going to a secular college and you're sitting under some of these professors, I want to remind you that you have no reason to hang your head. Amen. The Word of God is true. It is absolutely true. And we live in a, in a world that is celebrating evil and is mocking Christianity. They, they treat no other religion the way that they treat Christianity. Amen. They, they, have, they despise it and they mock it. And, uh, and so you're going to have to be strong. Don't be afraid to take a stand. Stand up for what you believe. And uh, let God use you in your universe. And I'm asking our, all, of our, all of our ministers could come. And I want you to get in front of them, behind them. And uh, we're going to pray that God would keep his hand upon them and protect their testimony this year. Keep them safe in their travels back and forth to the universities that they're attending. And uh, God would just keep his hand on them this year and use them. Could you stretch your hands out to all of our college students? God, I thank you, Lord, for every one of these young people. I thank you for their testimony, for their desire to learn. Father, I pray that you would anoint them, God. Use them, Jesus. back to your seats. Amen. Thankful for our young adults, all that God is doing in their lives. Amen. For those of you that I may not have met yet, my name is Eugene Wilson. I serve as executive pastor here at the Pentecostals of Katy. And uh, I am delighted tonight to have my friend, Reverend Jason Gallion and Sister Stephanie Gallion. These are our longtime friends, uh, my wife and I. We go way back about, I don't know, 25 or so years ago. I walked into a church in Terre Haute, Indiana that my father-in-law was pastoring. And uh, they were doing a remodel in the kitchen. I met uh, Brother Gallion, and within uh, probably 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds, we found out that both of us liked fly fishing. And uh, that started a lifelong friendship, and I am so thankful for the Galleons. I guess probably over the last 25 years or so, we probably had 15 or so um, vacations together, our families, and uh, very, very dear friends. He went on to become the Alaska youth president, pastored in Alaska, and then about 14 years ago, went to IBC, became the student pastor at IBC, and then uh, now serves as vice president of IBC, along with uh, assistant or the pastoral team there at Calvary Tabernacle and the preaches camps, conferences everywhere. He called me up earlier this summer. And for those of you who don't know, I serve as president of Texas Bible College. He called me up and he said, I know what you can do to double your enrollment in just a short period of time. And I said, well, what's that? He said, change the I to a T, which is T to an I. I've got, I messed that one up. T to an I, which was uh, Texas Bible College to Indiana Bible College. And so anyway, we have a lot of fun harassing one another. Would you stand with me right now? 
I want to I want to say as you, as you're standing, and I I've, I felt this so strongly earlier in the service. Listen to me just for one second. Listen to me real, just real quick, carefully for just one second. A lot of times we go to the house of the Lord and we feel His presence, and we have felt His presence, and we walk back out and we struggle with some things. And the reason is is because we have yet to hear what God is saying to us through His Word. Some of us struggle with some things, but his word has the answer. In fact, the Bible lets us know that he has exalted his word above his name. Amen. He asked me earlier, what time do y'all get out? I said, oh, about 9 o'clock. And I knew he's standing around and talk forever. I said, you can preach as long as you want to. Amen. How many love the word of the Lord? I know we love to praise him. How many love the word of the Lord? Would you put your hands together right now? We welcome Brother Gallion. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Thankful for my good friends, the Wilsons. It's an honor to be here in Katy, Texas this evening. We give honor to Pastor and Sister McKee, this amazing church. God has blessed you very much. Amen. Amen. We're so thankful that Georgian and Savannah are finally married. Amen. What an incredible young couple. I believe God has done great things in their life, will continue to do great things in their life, and we look forward to seeing the blessings of God upon them. Tonight, I'll do my best. I will not keep you till 9 o'clock, I promise you. I will dismiss and be out of here much, much quicker than that. Of course, my preaching has a tendency to feel longer than it actually is, and so I will do my best to shorten it down to where you don't get bored, fall asleep, or leave. I'm going to preach tonight on faith, but it will probably be the strangest message on faith that you've ever heard. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Job, the first chapter, and we're going to read chapter 1 and verse 1, 2, and 3. The title of this message, I'll give it to you because after we complete this reading, we will go to God in prayer and ask Him to touch our hearts to receive and our ears to hear. So the title of this message, and I will explain it later, is simply this, what Tuttle does, what Tuttle does. In Job chapter 1, it says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen. 500 she asses in a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east so if you would for the next few moments could we just close our eyes and lift our hands and let's ask the spirit of the lord to help us this evening lord we thank you for your touch that we felt tonight the liberty that we've experienced in our worship and lord i believe that you've already built faith because the word has gone forth it's gone forth in song, and it's gone forth from men that have stood behind this pulpit and quoted Scripture. And God, we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that there would be a great exercise of faith that is in this building. Not just so that we can see the impossible, but so that we can sustain ourselves to see what you've called us and asked us to become and to do. We give you great glory and honor. For you alone are worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor. And we love that name that you have given us, the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, my wife and I, we do this every fall around September in Indiana. We take a trip down to an apple orchard. I love apples to a degree. I'm not so fond of just raw apples, but I like them cooked with butter sugar sometimes in the form of a pie or the form of an apple dumpling or some sort of pastry but we show up nevertheless to visit this apple orchard and we fill up an entire wagon full of apples we take them back to the house and i hate to admit but there have been a times on occasion where they have rotted and we have thrown them away later but my wife does an excellent job cooking and preparing those apples for all of us to enjoy and so it kind of goes like this with two teenage boys. If you have teenage boys, maybe you've been in a very similar circumstance. We 
would go to the apple orchard and we pick a few apples and my wife and I end up doing most of the work while they get bored. And boredom with teenage boys ensues this. One of them will pick up a rotten apple and decide that it looks very much like a grenade. Thank you. That apple will be launched from incredible distance at high velocity, typically striking one at least in the head or possibly someplace else. Now panic ensues because mom is terrified that someone has received a concussion and one of the boys is crying and the other one's laughing and so discipline must be merited out. And in all of this chaos, I do what every good husband should do. I slowly retreat and allow mom to take care of the issue. This particular time, I can't remember if I was retreating or just got bored myself and I wandered through that orchard and made my way to the front looking for apple cider, apple fritters, apple sauce, apple donuts, apple pie, finding nothing like that at the apple orchard. I do what every preacher does and I engage in conversation with the individual that's selling apples. This orchard's called Tuttle's. Tuttle's Orchard. I, I don't believe it's owned by Brother Tuttle that pastors here in Indiana. I, I don't even think it has anything to do with him. I don't even know if Tuttle is a person, to be honest with you. It's just Tuttle's Orchard. I'm standing there, and, and there's some teenagers, and I start asking them questions about apples and cultivating apples and, and how it is to... And I was curious because every tree in that entire orchard was about six feet tall. The tops had been completely cut off, and these spinely strange branches would come out from the sides this apple tree I was curious I said what, what's what's going on with the trees what's what's wrong with them when I was a kid apple trees were massive they they towered above houses and, and she, the girl said oh we do that intentionally we, we top them off we trim them down she said we want you as the guest to be able to walk up to an apple tree and not have to stretch to pull the fruit off of those branches thank you that's very kind I like that I said hey I've heard something I didn't know if this is true and I said um what happens when a tree doesn't bear fruit? She said, oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. She said, but let me call the husband. So she made a phone call on a radio, or not a phone call, but a radio call, I guess. And sure enough, this guy walks in, and I thought, man, this is the dude that knows what he's talking about. But there are certain people that you trust your life to, right? Doctors, surgeons. Certain people you trust your cars to, mechanics. The person you don't trust your car to is a clean mechanic. You want one that's got grease under his fingernails and stains on his clothes. That tells me somebody that does the work and knows the work, right? This guy shows up. He's got not, not hipster car hearts. He's got actual car hearts on. They, they got tears in him and not intentionally. And, and he's got callus on his hand. And he's actually carrying a chainsaw at the moment. I'm like, if anybody knows the answer to this question, it's this guy right here. So I ask him the question. He said, yeah, he said, that has been done before. Uh, we've done that before. And here's the question I asked him. I said, what happens when a tree doesn't bear fruit? What do you do to, you cut it out? Do you, do you give it a second chance? Do you fertilize it? He said, well, that process that you asked me about is absolutely true. He said, here's the process. When a tree that has reached maturity and it does not bear fruit, he said, I'll take this chainsaw out into the orchard. I'll cut a a notch into the trunk of that tree and scar it deep. He said, I'll wrap it up to make sure that pests cannot get into it and bugs can't destroy it. He said, but when I scar that trunk of that tree, he said, it, the, the tree, something transforms that all of the sap rushes to that scar. It forms a protective barrier. That tree, its branches will be stunted in growth. No longer will it reach and stretch to the heavens, but now it begins to focus on the healing process of trying to solidify and, and that sap and, and, and cause it to repair itself. He said, in the healing process, he said, it takes maybe one season. He said, but shortly after, when season comes around, he said, that tree that has been focused on healing and restoration now begins to bear fruit. Something began to strike my spirit, and I begin to think of the process of the human conundrum. Because there are many people in this church alone, probably no doubt, that are sitting here and you've gone through processes of great pain and suffering. There have been moments where you've walked into church even possibly this Sunday night and, 
in your heart was not a heart of joy, it was not a heart of rejoicing or peace or strength, but it was one of brokenness, of trouble, and great pain was in your cry when you cried out in the middle of worship, not one of praise and adoration to God, but one of trouble and affliction. And I begin to think this question, why, God, would you allow your people to go through painful, hurtful processes? But I believe this, that God has allowed you to focus on the pain and the hurt in your life. And the process will be complete when God begins to demonstrate you bearing fruit in the church service. You see, it's not just good enough to walk in the church and to lift our voice in unison with believers around us and love God on Sunday and Wednesday, but there needs to be somebody that understands the purpose and the process of bearing fruit. There needs to be someone in this place that is not just content to be a Christian on the weekends, but somebody is here and you're saying, I want to give back to the spiritual aspects of the kingdom of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we must bear fruit. So my question is tonight, what happens? What happens when pain and suffering? Well, let me just stop right here because I feel that I need to clarify something. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to say next. Because I absolutely believe in miracles. I believe that God pours out his spirit upon all flesh. I believe the greatest miracle that has ever been seen by man is God filling them with the gift of the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. I believe one of the greatest miracles is the process of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We don't stop just at repentance, though repentance alone is incredibly powerful. It has the ability to break the chains of addiction. It has the ability to bring restoration to marriage. It has the ability to reach down and begin the process of absolute, complete forgiveness of a soul that is heavy and weary with sin. I also believe the second step is baptism in the name of Jesus, where we are buried in water that signifies his blood by complete immersion. And when we come out of that water, old things are passed away and we have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. I then believe that the gift of the Holy Ghost is in promise unto us that he will fill us with his spirit and that evidence is on display for all to hear by speaking in an unknown language. I also believe that God can heal your body. I believe that God can set you free. I believe that there is miraculous power any time we get together and lift up that name that is above every name. I believe that even tonight, without anybody laying their hand upon you, if you begin to call upon the name of Jesus, he can heal cancer in your body. I believe God can reverse sugar diabetes in your body. I believe God can bring healing to pain and deliver you right now because I believe that God performs miracles. But the question is, the question is, is the real question, is what happened when God does not? You see, we like to worship when we talk about faith and miracles, but oh, what happens when God does not do what we need him to do? You see, that's what I come to preach tonight. Because I believe there's a level of faith that goes beyond just the healing. Just the now. Just in the moment. Oh, I believe that there are men and women in this place that possibly your sickness is even unto death. But I didn't come here to preach a message that is depressing and heavy and calls you to walk out of here with your head hanging. I come here to tell you that even in your sickness and even in the darkest moment of your life, you do not walk this alone because God is with you. Oh, hear me. Hear me. I like that poem of the put footprints in the sand where that man looked back and that lady looked back and said in the darkest moments there was only one set. Why did you forsake me? And God said that's not the moment that I walked away but that's the moment that I picked you up and I carried you. Oh hear me God will bring you through. There's no stress and worry and anxiety and fear that God cannot work through. And so what happens when God does not do what we need him to do? 
I'll never forget several years ago, at the very beginning of a very perplexed time in our life with our 12-year-old son. I'm not going to preach this to get your pity. He doesn't need your pity. There was moments where we didn't know what was happening, but something was drastically wrong in his life. There's moments when your wife calls you, and she'll call your name as a husband and it's to take the trash out. It's not alarming. And there's other moments when she calls you that there's an urgency in her voice. It was downstairs, and she was upstairs, and I heard her call my name. Immediately, I, I experienced a little panic and fear, and I raced up to the stairs to find her in our youngest son's bedroom. He's lying on the floor in a fetal position. I immediately walked in. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't know. He, he can't respond. He's not responding. His speech was so slurred, body shaking all over, limbs twisted up, tongue sometimes even coming out of his mouth. The first response was, we, we, we got to get him to the hospital. My wife is praying. We're praying. We pick him up. I pick him up. I rush down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, his brother stops him. He says, Dad, before you take me to the hospital, can I pray over my brother? These are not super spiritual young men, let me tell you. I assure you. They're normal, average teenagers. But something was in that urgency of the moment where he laid his hand on his little brother and began to plead the blood of Jesus and calling upon that name. We did not see anything take place in that moment. But just because you can't see it in that moment doesn't mean that God isn't working. We load him up in the car and we're driving to the hospital. He starts texting family and friends, pray for Winston, pray for Winston, pray for Winston. We start to receive after we arrive at the hospital. We place him in a, in a wheelchair and push him back to the emergency room. They hook IVs up to this boy. They've got him in a bed now. And as we are there in the hospital, I begin to receive text after text. We're praying right now. We're going to God in prayer. All over the nation, friends and family and, and churches even begin to respond saying, we are praying as a body for Winston Galligan. Oh, it began to refresh my spirit. And though I couldn't see anything taking place in the form of supernatural power or authority, I knew that God was in control. Let me tell you this, four hours later, that boy got up out of that hospital bed and walked out on his own power with no aid from any doctor or medication. I wish I could tell you that God did the miraculous and healed his body in that moment, but he did not. And so it began to ensue the next few years really of his life. We start going down a journey trying to figure out what is wrong with our son. I hope and pray that none of you parents ever, though probably you might, doctors came back a few weeks later there's a four centimeter tumor in the middle of his brain inoperable we begin to diagnose him with multiple symptoms completely unrelated supposedly to this tumor we do what every parent would do we take him to church faithfully consistently we bring him to the front he's anointed with oil prayers are prayed there's one particular night they had special prayer at Calvary Tabernacle and we get home. Winston is very quiet in the car ride. When we arrive at the house, he, he's very contemplated. He said, Dad, I need to talk to you. He said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. He said, but there are men that come up and women that come up. And great men and great women that will lay their hand upon my head and begin to pray. He said, they pray and say things like, Winston, God has healed your body absolutely completely. He said, they call on the name and they speak faith. And they tell me that God has absolutely healed you, Winston. He said, but dad, I've been praying. And I feel that God spoke to me that that's not how my story is going to be written. He said, you see, I don't think that I will ever be healed from any of these sicknesses that are afflicting me. He said, but I believe that God is asking me one very important question. Winston, will you serve me even unto death? 
Oh, let me tell you, not any parent wants to hear their 13-year-old say something like that. And honestly, it didn't sound like a 13-year-old talking to me that night. But I believe God was beginning to reveal something about faith and trust, which I believe could be the step beyond faith. You see, it's enough to believe God can do anything. But it's a whole different subject to talk about what if he does not. Will I still live for him? Will I still be faithful to the house of God? Do I still believe he's a miracle worker? Do I still trust in the process? Do I still believe he has me in the palm of his hand? Is he still watching over us? Does he still have all power and all authority? You see, what God was doing was he was speaking to a 13-year-old, through a 13-year-old, to his mother and father. And this young man was building my faith because many times I fell on my face before God and I asked him, why? Why won't you? And God kept saying, but do you trust me? Do you trust me? You see, the step beyond your faith is where you place your life in the hand of God and whatever Satan brings against you does not deter your faith in who he is. So the step beyond faith. I've watched how God has done the miraculous. I've seen it. And I've also watched how God has sustained. A few years ago, I had the privilege of preaching with Joel Urshan. He told me the story. He said, man, he said, the hardest moment of my life, my greatest test of faith, was when I watched my grandmother, this incredible patriarch of Pentecost. He said, I watched her lying in a bed, having sustained horrific injuries in a car wreck. Every day of her life, she is in so much pain. She, she can't even move. and She can't even feed herself. He said, I would go and pray for her and talk to her. And he said, my spirit would get so heavy. And I would say, God, if this is how you reward your faithful, I want nothing to do with it. God, if this is what it looks like serving you faithfully all of your life, and, and this is what it looks like, I, God, I, can't, I cannot bear this cross. He said, I prayed for my grandmother and walked out to my car. He said, the presence of the Lord took me to my knees and said, how arrogant are you, Joel? You think that every morning when she wakes up, she does it because of her own power or the medication that she's taken the night before. Don't you understand that I sustain her? I hold her in my arms. She opens her eyes and she has nothing negative to stay, but she rejoices in the fact that God is forever faithful. His hand is upon her. Joel said, I learned a lesson that God, regardless of what we go through, sustains us and keeps us. So I'm preaching to somebody here. You're in the trial of your life and you don't see any way out, but you are not alone. And you do not walk this on your own merit, by your own strength. But God is there to lift you up. He is ever faithful. So I'm telling you, don't you give up on God because he's never given up on you. And regardless of what the enemy brings into your life, God will sustain. And so we look in this chapter of Job 1. The pedigree of Job is outstanding to say the least. The opening words talk about a man who was perfect and upright. and One that feared God and hated evil. There's nowhere else in Scripture that this pedigree is given to any patriarch of faith. Not this descriptive, at least. It goes on and says that there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. It lists in the third verse all the stuff that God had given him. We can say this, that there was none like Job. Everything that Job had, God had given him abundance of. The reason is, is because he was faithful. He was upright. He did what God asked of him. Even so much as when the enemy came to talk with God, God said, have you considered my servant Job? Satan hated this man. He believed that God had placed this hedge about him, that he couldn't touch him, he couldn't get access to him. We see that Satan petitions God and asks, give me access to him, to which God does. We see in the following verses that we will not read that 
something horrific begins to happen in Job's life. Systematically, very systematically. We begin to see that everything that Job has is taken from him. One servant after the other comes up and, Job, I hate to tell you this, but they're all gone. Your, your sheep, your camels, your oxen. Everything was removed from Job. Everything that possibly sustained him, that kept him, that gave him status in society was ripped away from him in moment after moment, in one moment. The worst news of the worst news is when the servant showed up and said, Job, your seven sons and three daughters, they, they were together. <laughs> and the walls fell in. And they're dead. Immediately, Job begins to go through this process. And I, I pray that if you're in that place where you've lost, I pray that God helps you with comfort and peace and strength. Job is now going through the battle of his life. He's in the darkest place that he could ever be. We, we could get into a theological discussion, no doubt, on his wife and what she truly meant. She looked at him in his despair. Now Satan has afflicted his personal body. Boils have popped out all over him. He's sitting in sackcloth in a pile of ash, scraping to give relief and pain with broken pottery. Maybe it was pity upon her part, or maybe she was disdained. Maybe she didn't trust like Job trusts. Curse God and die. His friends show up, and I don't know if you have friends. And I don't know if you have any knowledge of counseling. I'm, I'm not a counselor. There's other experts that, that know this. But I would say that his three friends that showed up, you probably should never do that. Because these three wonderful individuals showed up to help comfort Job. And, and for seven days and seven nights, they don't say a word to him. <laughs> but they just stare at him. Eliphazar, when he does open his mouth, says something so horrific. It's kind of a question. He says, well, Job, what, what did you do to deserve this? Job, Job, think about this now. <laughs> Look at everything that you've lost. Job, is there something in your life? He goes on and he said, behold, happy is the man who God correcteth. And therefore despise not the chastening of the Almighty. Now, that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> I, I don't want to be thankful when God corrects me. That's a, that's a painful process. Bilidad goes a step further. He doesn't just ask the question. He says, Job, I'm pretty sure, and I'll paraphrase this chapter, chapter 8. Job, I'm pretty sure that you've done something to deserve this. Zophar says, you know what, Job? You're, you're just a ranked sinner. That's why. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are doubled to that which is. Know therefore that God exacted thee less of thine iniquity, deserveth. So he's saying, Job, you're, you're in this problem because of the way you live. How many people have been there? You start facing crisis and turmoil and heartache and loss and brokenness and pain and sickness. And the enemy begins to tell you that you deserve this, that it's your life and you're a mess and God doesn't love you. And, and, and you know what? You, you, you got yourself into this. No, no, no. I don't believe that's the way God works. I believe that's an attack of the enemy because God does not rain out wrath upon those that he loves. It's the enemy. Come on, every good gift is from God. Every perfect gift is from God. Everything that God does is he blesses and he extends grace and mercy. Oh, there may be consequences to sin. Uh, don't get me wrong. Wrong, but I don't believe your sickness is a result of God hating you or disliking you. I don't believe that your sorrow and your trial is because God doesn't love you. No, no, I don't believe that at all. And so when they begin to suppose and human nature would allow us to get to this place where, where we would think that I deserve what I'm going through. Let me tell you this. That doesn't fit with a God of grace and mercy. You know why? Because he didn't come to this earth and die so that you could continue walking forward in pain and suffering. But he came to live 
lift you up and to encourage you. You want to know where you should be when you're going through your trial? You shouldn't be out in the world because that has nothing to give you. You need to be in the house of the Lord because he'll sustain you and he'll keep you and he'll watch over you. And so we know, we know what happens with Job. I'm trying to hurry. We know what happens with Job. He doesn't curse God. He never abandons his faith. He remains faithful. He serves him with all of his heart. He's a man of character and integrity. Job is that man that remained perfect before God. He remained upright before God. Oh, thank you, some elders that have been walking this all your life that have never abandoned truth and righteousness and holiness. Thank you to these elders that are here that lift up their hands. Men, lift up holy hands before God. Thank you to some of these elders that have been righteous and set an example for those to follow behind. You want to know what? You can live for God. Young person, you can follow in their footsteps. You will be able to make it. The world is not too tough. It doesn't have a pull on you that you can't break. And God can set you free. And God can keep you. Come on, you don't have to be like all your peers. You don't have to walk into your school and feel the pressure to compromise. Because they didn't compromise and you can live for God. Guess what, young adults going off to college? You don't have to backslide. You don't have to walk away. You're not a statistic that Barna Research Group is going to print someday in the future. But guess what? You live beyond reality. You live beyond statistics. You will make it. You'll keep your faith. You'll start a P7 club. You'll start a campus ministry. You'll reach those around you. Why? Because God can do it through you. So Job remained faithful. And we find in chapter 42... Because of his faithfulness, God began to honor Job. It says right here in 42 and 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And so that the Lord, verse 12, blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. You see, it was in Job's faithfulness in the greatest crisis of his life that God began to double his blessings. Now hear me. Job didn't walk away and come back. Job stayed. You know what I believe? I believe there's apostolics that are receiving a double portion of blessings because you stayed where God wanted you to stay. You didn't fluctuate. You didn't walk away. Come on, I believe there's men and women in this church and some of you look at them and say, why are they so blessed? It's because they've gone through the trial that many would have faltered and fell and walked away. You see, sickness is not the end. Death is not the end. Crisis is not the end. As a matter of fact, you learn more in the valley than you'll ever learn on the mountaintop. It's when you walk to the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil that God begins to display that he is with you, that there is no way he'll depart from you, that he will keep you and watch over you. And so what does God do? He begins to bless. The Lord blessed the latter near Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she-asses. And then we get to verse 13. He had also seven sons and three daughters. This always perplexed me. And I thought for many times this may be the heir in Scripture. Because when we turn to chapter 1, 7,000 sheep, that's double. 3,000 camels, that's double. 500 yoke of oxen, that's double. 500 she has, yeah, that's double. Verse, verse 12, 42, God doubled everything that Job lost. But then I get to Verse 2 of chapter 1. They were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Now in chapter 42, when God is doubling everything that he has, seven sons and three daughters. And I was confused by that for years. I've heard it preached. I've watched it skipped over. I've skipped over my own sermons. And then it dawned on me. 
that God doubled everything that Job lost. You see, Job didn't lose his children. They were just in a different place. You see, that's why Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? Ladies and gentlemen, death is not the end. Because those that have departed are not lost and gone. You see, what happened with Job's children is they had been placed in another place. <laughs> you see, Job hasn't lost anything. I'm here to tell you that death is not the victory that Satan thinks that he has over the saint. But death is just the beginning. Because where our treasures are... And where we've laid up treasures is not upon this earth that moss and dust doth corrupt. But we have laid up treasures in heaven where no man can steal. The thief cannot break in. There's no corruption of those treasures. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about the process of our relationship and our walk with God completely different than the way we think. You see, when trials come, it's just a temporary inconvenience because God has not created us just to live in the here and now. Seventy years upon this earth is not the goal for the saint of God because every living, breathing soul is destined for eternity. Whether you choose to fulfill the scripture and partake of the gospel or not there's an eternity that waits upon you but the believer oh hear me the believer what we have solidified by allowing God to redeem us is we have solidified a mansion and streets of gold and gates of pearl Oh, what am I preaching? I'm preaching that there's faith. There's faith. Let me tell you, Winston, God is going to heal his body. It may not be on this side, but it will be on the other side. I'm not worried about what the enemy is bringing against this whole carcass called flesh. But you see, my, my life and my eyes are on something eternal. So I'm trying to close. You see, God looks at death differently than we look at death. We turn to Genesis, the fourth chapter, and we begin to see something very peculiar begin to develop. It's lineage. This lineage in Genesis 4, I'll jump around, is right after it states the, the horrific death of Abel by his brother Cain. God marks Cain. If you were to look at this lineage, you see that several of the names in Cain's race ends in L, which stands for Elohim. But given a few more generations, that L is dropped, and so the mention of God is erased from the family lineage. If we were going to look at this particular chapter, we see that there is the name Irad. It's simply a fugitive city of, of war. It means wild donkey. I've always been perplexed by that because isn't it interesting that the firstborn of every donkey, there must be a sacrificial lamb given. We begin to read names like Lamech has two wives. We find for the very first time in Genesis 4, polygamy is now introduced in Scripture, which plagues every patriarch from this moment on. We begin to see the influence of these men. His two wives, Adhi and Zilhi, simply mean ornamental and seductress. It's the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling two of those sins that plagued Adam and Eve in the garden after the serpent had caused Eve to take of the fruit. The first songs that were written in Scripture were not written in praise to God, but were written right here by Cain's lineage, an evil lineage. The song kind of went like this. It was, and I'll paraphrase you think that Cain was avenging when he killed his brother. You let someone take a life from me, Lamech, and I will pour out my vengeance sevenfold. As they were songwriters. Some were cattle barons. Some crafted ornamentation out of gold, precious metals. Others were sheep herders. It talks about in this one chapter, this evil lineage, everything that they attained on this earth. How blessed, how powerful, how talented, how strong. 
And then what's even more perplexing is when you flip one chapter over to chapter 5 and you begin to see the righteous lineage. The righteous lineage. The lineage of Seth. Cain's lineage and evil lineage. Describing all that they attained on this earth. But the righteous lineage of Seth is not so. As a matter of fact, this chapter is very reminiscent of Shakespeare and his play King Lear. Act 5 and scene 3, it says this when the king died. Simply no fanfare, no parade, no accolades, just two words, he died. And that's exactly what we find in the righteous lineage. It goes down. Adam, Seth. Enos, Canaan. And these words are mentioned after it tells of their age. And he died. Doesn't talk about what they accomplished on this earth. Doesn't talk about what they were good at. Doesn't talk about the house they lived, the car that they drove. I'm not against any of those things. I pray you have the, the best house in the neighborhood. You drive the nicest car in the parking lot. But you see, what we see here is not what they attained on this earth. Because one theologian, out of all of these names, ten of them, Enoch is not mentioned because he was translated. And Noah was the one that was not mentioned because at this time, at the writing, he was still alive. But in every one of these names, it just simply says, and he died. One theologian gives explanation, which I really like. He said, at those words, those three words, and he died, the heavens erupted in voluminous praise. Because a righteous son had come home. You see, the way God looks at death is not the way that we look at life. We think that we have to get a good education, and I'm for education. We're in the education business. We think that we have to achieve something upon this earth, and we spend our entire life and process and fun trying to get and live the American dream. There's nothing wrong with that. But oh, let me tell you, God doesn't look at life that way. You see, he looks at life that's eternal. There's not a beginning and an end. Oh, hear me. There is a beginning, but there's not an end. You see, what God is preparing is not what we can acquire upon this earth, but what we lay up in treasures in heaven. Because God said that what you attain on this earth, it will pass away. But those things that you put up in heaven, there's no passing away. Because one glad morning, when this life is o'er, I'm going to spread my wings and fly away. Though there's coming a day. When that trumpet is going to sound, oh, ladies and gentlemen, have we gotten so comfortable in the life that we live and the things that we possess that we haven't thought that there's a heavenly home that God is preparing this church. This church is not to build another building. This church is to pre prepare hearts and souls for the second coming of God. This church isn't just to have a good community. This church is here to get somebody to the other side. And so here's my hope. <laughs> I didn't mean it shouldn't build another building. You have to build. But what I mean is we can't get so fixated on here and now. Because God is saying it's eternity. It's eternity. You want to know why this preacher, this pastor gets up and preaches with everything that's within him? These musicians, I watched them during the worship service. It wasn't just entertainment or something that they do. They were giving their all in worship and adoration to God. It was so that there would be one soul snatched from the grip of the enemy that was destined for eternity in a devil's hell that was trespassing against the perfect will of God that hopefully would find themselves at an altar of repentance so that they could be redeemed and have their name on a mansion in heaven. Oh, I don't know about you, but I want somebody to preach about heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to be reminded that I've got a mansion, that over there there's no pain and there's no sorrow there's no hurting on that side there's no more struggles there's no more temptation there's no more battles for me to go through there's no more losses but God has prepared a place for his church and so this is my altar call these musicians come and everyone stands to their feet I pray that God would change our perception of why we're here and what we are doing. I pray that somebody that's going through the darkest moment of your life. That God would begin to quiet anxiety. And depression and heaviness and fear. 
and God would give you a hope and blessed assurance that one day you're going to step across to that other side. Oh, hear me, those that have gone before us, we're going to lock arms with them and begin to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. One day, this world is going to pass away and all the troubles and all the problems that it brings. This life, this life, oh, hear me, hear me. I'll never forget Brother Jones. Brother Jones that had preached the gospel for over 60 years and now a retired minister could barely walk and move and would be asked to testify and somebody would literally have to go down and pick him up off the second row and begin to help him to that pulpit. He would, couldn't even walk up those three stairs by his own strength but there were many a times that I would come over and lift him up because his body was so frail and overwhelmed but brother Jones had a purpose and that purpose was when he stood behind that pulpit to testify of the goodness of God he wasn't thanking God for helping him through this life he wasn't thanking God for allowing him to be blessed while he's here but you know what he began he would say this the devil tried to kill me but the Lord was on my side and one glad morning you see, Brother Jones still preached it. He still believed it. That regardless of what his physical body was going through, God had prepared something greater for him. So I'm preaching faith. I'm preaching faith. Because the circumstances that you're in right now, God says that doesn't define you. Because not only will I pick you up, and not only will I help you through, I've got something greater prepared. All across this sanctuary, every eye closed. I'm preaching to somebody that the doctor's report is overwhelming. I'm preaching to somebody that you've been where Winston's been. You're fighting through and trying to say, I don't know if I can stay positive. I, I don't know if I have much hope. Maybe you're here and, and you're the spouse or a parent or a loved one of that person or individual that received that devastation. And you're saying, God, why have you forsaken me? Is it because I failed? Is it because of my past? No, 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 no. God's not going to leave you. I want you to step out of your pew right now because God's going to begin to lift you up. Come on, there's blessed assurance. God is wanting to restore hope and strength. Come on, God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. Is there someone here you're being pushed down by the enemy? Anxiety every night that you lay your head on your pillow. You can't even breathe because the weight is pushing down and ripping the breath out of your lungs. I'm here to say that God is going to give you peace that passes your intellect. It passes your understanding. God's going to deliver you. God's going to lift you up. God's preparing you. God's going to speak a word of faith in your heart. Come on, God will walk with you through every trial. The darkness will not suffocate you and it cannot surround you because God will be the light that will shine in darkness. God will be the peace that passes what God the enemy has told you cannot be passed upon. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I plead the blood in your name, in your name. Come on, let's see somebody reach out in their spirit. Somebody encourage another.
I'm gonna trust you still I will follow Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When the Gallium was preaching about trust and direction and knowing God is with you and God hasn't abandoned you, though you face trial, you face trouble. You know, trust, I believe, is it's, it's a different level of faith, faith in God, that God's just going to work it out. The kind of trust that was demonstrated by the patriarchs and by the prophet, it seems to lean more into trust than it does our version, uh, our modern version of faith. Amen. When Elijah... Elijah's servant, Gehazi, comes and says, well, we're surrounded. We don't know what to do. We're in trouble. The prophet Elijah says, Lord, open up his eyes. I don't know that he saw anything himself. We don't have any proof that Elijah saw anything. He just trusted that the angels of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I mean, you, sometimes you just got to you got to just act in faith and know that God's with us. Amen. And trusting God really is all about knowing that his presence is with you. You know, <clears throat> some of us are looking for direction in life, and we don't know which way to turn. We have get, been given a custom formula for receiving, a, a method, a, just sort of a how-to directive on how to receive direction from the Lord. He said, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He would direct your paths. You know, that, that does not mean 
in all of your ways, you've got to take a moment. I've got to go find a place of prayer, and I've got to pray and get an answer. Because some of us pray, and we still don't know. He, what he, he, all he said was, you just got to acknowledge him. I, I know I've said this before, but those of you that are watching on our, our broadcast, on our live stream, uh, you're having a bit of a different experience than those that are live, listening on Revival Radio. We've got listeners, over 600 or so, 600,000 listeners on Revival Radio around the world. And I thank God for all of them. But those that are listening, you're imagining what this service looks like. You're imagining what it, what it seems like. You know, I, I could, if I were to call someone out in the, in the crowd and I said, you know, Brother Carlos Saunders, good to see you tonight. You look good in that gray jacket and, and tie. His name has not been referenced at all in the service. So those that are listening have no idea that he's here. But when I took time to acknowledge his presence, suddenly all those that all their they're limited to is just the audible. Suddenly they realize Brother Carlos Saunders is in the room. And that's, that's all he asked us to do is just to acknowledge him. So all I have to do when I'm facing trial is take a moment and say, God, I know you're with me. That's it. That's all he said to do. Acknowledge him. And if we will acknowledge that God is with us in all of our trials, troubles and trials and burdens and crisis on our job a crisis in home and sickness just acknowledge you know what God we know you're here that's all he said to do he would direct our steps he'd tell us all right here's what the next step you need to take and here's the move you need to make amen I want you to know that you are not in your situation by yourself God is with you. So every day you need to acknowledge, God, I'm not going to work alone. I'm not going to the doctor's appointment alone. Amen. God, you're with me. I acknowledge him. Amen. Take time to acknowledge him every day. He's with you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, Brother Galleon, for that word today. It has been a busy week. I know many of you are very tired, and so we're going to let you go home and get a good night's sleep. Thank you for being in the house of God. For all of our students that are leaving for college, please, please be careful on your journeys and know that we're praying for you all week long. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. I love you. We'll see you back here Wednesday night. God bless you. Let's go change our world. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.